Thank you for the introduction, Um Yeah, I want to share a little bit about my research. Uh, PhD candidate at Vic Uni, and uh, a bit of a spoiler alert there in the title, but I'm um, starting to quite get some uh, findings that would be counterintuitive to a lot of people. Probably not counterintuitive to anyone in this room, though. <clears throat> Uh, what's the problem? Again, I don't need to tell anybody in this room what the problem is, but um, there you go. Um, I guess I just wanted to put this slide in to show that I have come from the same place that a lot of people have, and that this is sort of the visible part of the problem, is we get these waste products at the end of their life, and part of that is actually because of how we Define waste, um, but it causes all of these problems, and the amount that we're producing is ever increasing, and it's just projected to get worse well into the future. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, as I went through this journey, uh, we again, I don't need to tell anybody what this diagram is. Yeah. But uh, the waste hierarchy, I know there's a hundred different versions of the waste hierarchy. I quite like this one because it doesn't bring into anything to do with repurposing and all these other things that people argue about where it belongs. But generally, we have a prioritized list here. Some things are better than others, uh, down to landfill or disposal right at the bottom. And through this journey, I'm trying to figure out how this waste hierarchy applies to my research. And I started seeing a lot of parallels between the waste hierarchy and the linear value chain in terms of if we fail to prevent something being created and it enters uh, or it gets produced, then that by definition represents production. And once it's been produced, if it enters into use, then that is consumption. And if we fail to keep it in use, then we are disposing of it. And once we get down to this level, we're just talking about how do we manage the problem once we've already created it. And again, those photos, <coughs> excuse me, those photos that I showed earlier are all looking at this very small triangle at the bottom here. That's how most people uh, define waste. And it's how a lot of people view the problem as well. But we all know that that is just the tip of the iceberg. And there's this entire structure underneath that supports that. This entire value chain that is allowing this little piece to be visible. I did spend a long time on the animation. <laughs> <laughs> did you? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so getting into this, uh, I've tried to, the logical place to start is to look at the material flows through society. So I've made this model here. Uh, hopefully you guys can see this. Uh, feel free to move closer if it's a bit small. But effectively, we have virgin materials coming into the system. And we have a stock, these squares represent stocks of materials that are ready for manufacture. When we manufacture them, that's the production phase of the value chain. We have a stock of things that have been made here. We sell it, and that is consumption. And at this consumption point, where materials are in use, we have a decision. So we can throw that, yeah, this is my prop. We can throw this in the rubbish bin, and it goes straight to landfill. If we decide to put it in the recycling bin, it probably still goes to landfill. <laughs> uh, I mean, sorry. Um, <laughs> it's, uh, it goes to a material recovery facility and the contamination gets sorted out. So some of it does go to landfill. A lot of it is exported 
Um, the dream that we're all sold is that it will go back into materials to be used and go round and round forever more. We all know how we're after. Um, so we can run this model, and I should note that these values in here are just relating to plastic products. So this plastic bottle is recyclable, so there is a 60% chance that I, it will get recycled, be separated for recycling. Once it goes to the material recovery facility, 14% chance that it is contaminated, which means 86% chance that it will continue on to go recycled. And you can see from the graph there that this model just means that we are producing more and more waste into the future. Uh, and so we can run some hypothetical um, scenarios on this. And what if we magically recycle everything? So everything we produce is recyclable. You can see that the waste sent to landfill does come down, but it's still not zero. And that's because of the contaminated proportion. So again, if we live in a magical land where this is possible, 100% recycling and 0% contamination. Yes, we can do a lot better. We can reduce uh, waste to landfill, in this case, to zero. But what I hope is interesting is this black line, which you might be able to see my um, uh, legend, but that represents the amount of material that's entering the system. So this, if we think about our waste hierarchy, yes, we can reduce the amount that is ending up in landfill, but it's not turning off the tap of what's coming into the system. The only way to do that is to start reducing consumption. And Emma's already explained a lot of this, so probably not surprising. But uh, that brings in my research, which is using systems thinking methods. Uh, I'm trying to map out systemic problems, and to do that, use cause and effect logic. Uh, the idea being that we're trying to find feedback loops. So, why is that every day? Um, the main research question that I'm trying to identify is how do we identify, uh, how do we reduce, sorry, what is driving waste generation? And that is in relation to this point here. If this is our key driver that we need to reduce, then we need to understand what is driving that consumption. For my research, uh, I've had to narrow it down to make it uh, doable. So I'm focusing in what I'm defining waste generation as the consumption of single-use plastics. Uh, and of course, every presentation needs a good quote. This is my favorite. Uh, every system is perfectly designed to get the results it gets. Uh, that doesn't mean that that design is intentional. I think that's very important to realize that we can accidentally design systems uh, and end up getting exactly what it's meant to get. So what does it mean to map out a systemic problem? Um, I'm using something called causal loop diagrams, which is all about cause and effect logic, trying to identify feedback loops. And it's those feedback loops that create interesting behavior. So an example is uh, single-use plastic Sorry, it's so small. Um, Single-use plastic packaging sales. If I buy this bottle, I then throw it in the rubbish bin, which creates more waste. And doing that, I feel bad about myself. So I feel less justified continuing my consumption patterns, which means next time I buy less of the product. Okay? This is called a balancing feedback loop. So every time you go around, the uh, the push is in the opposite direction to where you started. So we started off with more sales, creates more waste, reduces our justification, which reduces the sales next time around. So we get this oscillating sort of behavior. Of course, the argument uh, we all hear and probably used on ourselves, I know I have, is that I'm different and I'm going to take this plastic bottle and I'm going to recycle it. Okay? And if I put it in recycling, then I'm actually diverting waste from landfill, which means I'm reducing the amount of waste created. I feel good about myself, and therefore I can go and buy another plastic bottle. 
So this is called a reinforcing feedback loop, and that creates exponential growth or decay, depending on how you start the system off. These loops are relatively easy to understand when they're by themselves, but what happens when you start to combine these loops? Okay, Which loop dominates over the other one? And how does that change over time? So the reinforcing loop might dominate at the start and then peak out with the balancing loop. And you can get all sorts of interesting behavior. And the more loops you combine, the more complicated the whole thing becomes. Yeah. Can I just ask the two students what's vibration? So there's great, great hmm. thoughts over Can you see that on Zoom now? Just on that great analysis you did of the system. Right. Um, so does that include the energy box? Being in that production cycle, because you're dealing with material capacity, but when you're looking at what does this cost overall, does it include energy and other resources required to, say, recycle? Uh, it doesn't in the part that it shows you, but it will in the next part that I'm about to do. <laughs> so uh, that's a very interesting point. So this is a, uh, sorry about that, everyone. Um, this is a, a bit of a boundary diagram of where my system lies. And so what I just showed you was this little material flows module. And that is fed with actual data, which is very limited. And it's often used as an excuse uh, for inaction, and always saying, especially those of you who deal with MEP and all the rest, is that we need better data before we can do anything, hands are tied. Uh, this type of modeling is actually really good at saying, we don't need more data. Uh, a lot of what we can do is actually infer data, and more than what we're looking at, we're not looking at if we produce one tonne of waste versus 1.36 tonnes of waste, we're looking at a trend. Is this growth? Is it exponential? Is it overshoot and collapse? Is it decay? Is it oscillation? Those are what we're quite interested in this type of modeling. So just as an example, so this is the same material flow map. Again, this might be quite hard to see, sorry, uh, without the colors. And I've compared it to the actual data that we have. So the pink lines are the actual data. The red lines are what my model is reproducing. So, I am pretty happy with those results. So that comes back to what is actually driving those sales. And I've focused on two different areas. Uh, there are more, and I've spoken with Hannah and Liam about this and start to get some ideas of trying to include others. But in this case, I'm looking at harm, which will bring in the energy stuff that you mentioned, and business cases. And an example of that would be uh, if you increase the sales of single-use plastic packaging, the businesses that are using them make more money. They have more money to spend on marketing, which increases attractiveness, and so you get more sales. Uh, another path might be you have increasing sales, increasing money. Uh, all of those people that are sending their product in a reusable form or refillable form look over the fence and think the grass is greener and say, look, all these guys doing single use are making more money than we are. And so it encourages people into that single use business model. So that increases sales. Um, the other part that I'm looking at is harm. And all of them feed into this variable known as attractiveness. Uh, and what is quite interesting here is that attractiveness is a subjective variable. It's not based on reality, it's based on our perceptions of reality. And that becomes quite important in this harm module because we have uh, a stock of perceived harm. That is our interpretation of what is happening. And the interesting thing is there are time delays between what we observe and what we perceive. And so an example might be if I this is going to be a terrible cut. If I throw this in the ocean out there and watch what happens, probably nothing. Okay? 
There's very long feedback loops. If I saw a dolphin jump out, eat this straight away, choke, and end up on the beach, I'd feel terrible. <laughs> but we don't have those quick feedback loops. And that is very common with environmental problems. It's the same thing with climate change and all the rest. Uh, I was talking to Anita this morning about microplastics. These have been happening for a long time, and the research is only just starting to come out about the harm that we are causing through our actions. So it can take years, it can take decades for us to be able to observe the consequences of our actions. Perception, however, is very quick. If I put this in the recycling bin, I can make up a whole story in my mind instantly about how this white chocolate dolphin that means that there's less raw resources being dug up out of the ground. Uh, all of these benefits are very quick. And so this blue line at the top represents the objective harm that will be created. Uh, and this, in order to quantify this, I have used energy use throughout the life cycle uh, based on LCA studies and also carbon emissions throughout the life cycle. So you can see the objective harm is far higher than anything that we might perceive or any benefits that we might perceive. But because of these time delays, we actually think the system is getting better. But the act of things like recycling makes us feel that we are doing better. And if perceived harm is decreasing, attractiveness is increasing, and therefore we increase demand, which is exactly what we're seeing. And so I guess my whole argument was that in a static system, which is how these problems are often applied to, is saying, if we just look at that, then yes, incineration might be better than landfill. But as we've heard before, and my example is recycling, but these don't operate in a static environment. It's operating in a dynamic environment where the act of recycling or the act of incinerating, you're signing contracts for future uh, and it's actually, all it's doing is turning the tap on faster to things coming in. And so my argument is that perhaps the act of recycling is actually creating more waste. Thank you. Thanks so much, Do we have questions? Yeah, um, I can see your your diagrams. I've often got a lot of talk about the You want to repeat the question? Oh, yeah. So the question was around uh, toxicity and if I have included that uh, in my modeling work. The answer is no, but <laughs> um, I definitely looked at that. And part of the problem with, again, all of these environmental problems is there are so many different, uh, and the solutions in fact, there are so many different metrics that are hard to combine into one to say, yeah, economics is great at putting a dollar term on everything, but that's not the case when it comes to a lot of environmental problems. It's hard to quantify them all with the same metric to be able to compare to either. So, no, I haven't, uh, mainly because I found it quite difficult to apply those values throughout the uh, value chain, uh, whereas energy use, lots of LCA studies I've found saying that is a good proxy for overall environmental harm. So generally, if something uses more energy, then it's probably also more toxic. Uh, and same with carbon emissions, that's a bit of a hot topic at the moment. So, uh, and as you can see from a lot of those diagrams, they're showing the same trend even if you look at energy use or carbon emissions. Um, they're, they're seeing the same behaviour. The awesome presentation, Lauren. Thank you so much. Awesome work you're doing. Yeah, I just got a question surrounding our like, circular economy. That's such a word we're all hearing lately. Mm -hmm. um, circular economy. Do you think that is a real long term solution? Or do you think it's just a justification again 
to recycling our way to more waste? Yeah. Uh, I would, so the question was, is circular economy a potential solution or just another justification? Uh, and I would say that it could be either, depending on how we implement it. We can we can use it as an excuse to show that we are, or pretend that we are doing better, or if we actually take into account these dynamics, uh, we could potentially do things better. Uh, and as has been said here, there will be um, certain things are going to be a lot harder to get rid of. And we should be using plastics for what we really need to use them for, not for uh, everything we don't. And the worry is that we use it for what we don't, but just say, oh, look, we can recycle it. Uh, and I guess that's the whole theory behind the waste hierarchy anyway, is that we need to be starting at the top yeah. uh, and not trying to climb our way back up from the bottom. Hey, Warren, awesome presentation. Yeah. Um, fascinated with your diagrams. I'm just wondering, did you... Um, Consider in your research or come across Nakahara's research uh, or around behavior change and that when the consumer is faced with uh, negative information around pollution, that they um, actually would switch off to it and thereby consume more. I, mean, I think maybe it's kind of on the fringes of your thinking, yeah. but just curious around that. Yeah, no, I haven't come across that, but I might come and have a chat with yeah. you later. Yeah, yeah. yeah. thank you. Yeah. Oh, sorry, the question was if I had come across a particular type of research that, no, I haven't. <laughs> <laughs> um, thanks, I'm going to ask a question that should have uh, might sound like I haven't listened to your important point that we're going to clean enough and we don't need more data. Nevertheless, I'm quite interested just in terms of your process and trying to put this analysis together. What has that reflected to you about what we don't know and how we're actually not, do we don't know this, you know, cycling the what's the kind of our challenge and has it been to reach now to try to do something for them? Mm. Okay, uh, I will paraphrase that, correct me if I'm wrong. Effectively, um, what data don't I have and what issues that has caused? Yeah, okay. Um, it's been a big problem, effectively. Again, I've come into this like everyone else, and if we just had the data, we can compare it directly to it. Uh, and the further I go through that, actually the modeling process almost tells us what data we need. So instead of the, the, the general way of thinking, if we had the data, then we can figure out the solution. Whereas I'm saying, if we can do this modeling, we can approximate the values uh, it needs to be verified. This is this is not finished. There are some tweaks to be made. Uh, but mm. through this process, we can start to see what variables are actually important. And those are the ones we might need more data on, rather than just saying, oh, we need to know more of everything and use that as an excuse for inaction in the process. What's going on? Um, yeah. How do you build this model? How do you start to create this model and the potential answers? So do you run interviews? Um, how was the process? Yeah, so the process, sorry, the process was, the uh, question was, sorry, uh, what was the process to create these models? Um, I was meant to be doing group model building sessions, so working with lots of experts, but COVID destroyed all of that. But most of this has been done from the literature. Uh, there are actually a few studies showing how relationships work together and then through validation you figure out what you need to talk to experts about and say uh, for example um, that harm is this a reasonable representation of reality is this how people make decisions or not uh, and if you do that for a few different of those key variables then you can get some confidence uh, I'm not pretending that this is what actually happens. This is just a approximation of reality. Uh, but yeah, we can start to build up that confidence just by checking out the key variables and making sure those relationships make sense and passes the sort of common sense to us. Yeah. And then 
where there is data. So a lot of the data here that I've, I have got is um, to import and export data. So we know how much resin we import into New Zealand, which is one of the main reasons of narrowed it right down to plastics. Uh, and also how much waste is sent to landfill. And there's lots of reports, whether it's SWAT reports, or Sunshine Yanks has done lots of reports on um, waste analysis and how much different proportions are. And so you use those maximum assumptions and you get an approximation of how much plastic is what we're throwing out. Yeah. Plastic waste export, export data. Yes. Uh, so the question was that um, other researchers have had difficulty obtaining this data. Uh, yes and no. So with the university, we had contracts with Statistics New Zealand, and I emailed them, and they came back and said, "No, we're not going to give that to you." Uh, effectively, they said it would take months in order to process the data that I was requesting. Yeah. And I was just a bit stubborn and said I needed it. And yeah, eventually they got it to me. So yeah, I have all of the imports and exports for everything now, except obviously from uh, the year 2000. So I'm happy to share that. What are you doing? It's national data, yes. So it's, it's uh, when something's imported or exported, they need to fill out a customs declaration, and it's all of that data. So it's I've had to go right down to the finest grain level to get a tonnage. For some reason, beyond that, apparently people aren't interested in how much tons, they just want to know the value. So very easy to get the value of things, but it's very difficult to get an actual uh, tonnage. So that's the data that I have. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thank you.